Okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Surah so number 11, so we're on page 27 I'll just read the Arabic وَمِنْهَا أَنَّهُ وَجْدَ فِي الْمُعْجَزَتِهِ مَا هُوَ أَظْهَرَ مِنْ فِي الْعَجَارِزِ مِنْ الْمُعْجَزَاتِ الْغَيْرِهِ كَتَفَجْرَ الْمَا بَيْنَ أَسْبَاحِ فَنَا أَبْلَغَ فِي الْعَادِ مِنْ تَفَجْرَ مِنَ الْحَجْرِ لِأَنَّ جنس الحجر مما يتفجر منه الماء فكانت موجزة بالانفجار الماء من, ال... من بين أصباعه أبلغ من الانفجار الحجر لموسى عليه السلام So one of the other miracles is uh, one of these miracles that are distinguished from the miracles of others by a greater degree of inimitability such as the causing of uh, the causing water to gush between his fingers so this happened quite a few times and if you look at the footnote number 18 it's got the hadith in there so Ernest bin Malik said that once I asked the Messenger of Allah when he was close to Asr prayer the people looked for water to do wudu but we did not find it the Messenger of Allah brought his wudu water and the Messenger of Allah placed his hand in a vessel and commanded people to do wudu from it. And he said, Anas bin Malik, I saw water gushing from under the finger under his fingers, and the people did wudu until the last of them had done wudu. There was a few actually, it's quite a few. There wasn't just at Hudaybiyah, there was there was one at Hudaybiyah, which is the famous one. Yeah, so that one's at Hudaybiyah, there's this one, which is at Tal Zawah, place in Medina. It's also narrated by Anas bin Malik and there was about 300, and, uh, 300 um, companions there There's quite a few I think I remember in the other book about miracles there's quite a few So it's not just in Hudaybiyah, there's, one, there's quite a few and there's quite a few times that the same thing happened And that's one of the things about the miracles of the Prophet it, it, the same things happen again and again So like this one, there's, there's about, I think there's at least three that I, uh, I can find, maybe there's more but there's three that I can uh, find. So there's one, that obviously the one that uh, we spoke about. I think that one's the one in the footnotes, on footnote 18 on page 27. But if I remember rightly, there's that book, Jabir ibn Abdullah. So that's from a different Sahabi. That one's definitely in Hudaybiyah. This could be in Hudaybiyah, but there's nothing to indicate which one. But there's more than one miracle, more than one miracle from water gushing between his fingers. Uh, so, the, so he says that this is a great uh, breaking of the norm of patterns than making water gush from a rock because water does normally come out of some rock structures so if water comes out of the rock, so he's referring to the miracle of Musa alayhi islam when he's put his staff because uh, when the twi- 12 tribes of, Ibra- is, uh, of Bani Israel came and asked for water that he put his staff into the rock and then 12 springs came out so, so they're saying that no, that's what normally happens because water can come from rocks but would, does water normally come out of fingers? Well, maybe if you like got my hands, maybe some sweat would come out after you get warm. But there's not going to be no water that's going to come out of my fingers, right? <laughs> so the water doesn't normally come out of fingers, right? So that's why it, it's in, t- in, in its type of miracle, it's greater because water normally doesn't come out of fingers. Yes, it's a greater breaking of the norm. Breaking of the norm is like harq uh, al which is like breaking of the normal patterns of things, which indicates to a miracle, which is an indication of itself a miracle. So it's saying that this type is it's a greater type of miracle, basically. Uh, and, and the whole part of learning of miracles is really just to, you know, strengthen one's iman, really, because, you know, we get a lot of attacks, especially now, a lot of uh, media, newspaper uh, attacking Islam and doing all those sort of things, but we need to know that uh, you know this deen is true, and you know that believers have always had bad press. You know, we've always had bad press. You know, even going back as far as when the Ottoman Empire was coming to a collapse in like hundred odd years ago, when the British and the European clo- uh, colonial powers were, were conspiring against the Ottoman Empire. They used to call the Ottoman Empire the terror of the East, which is really interesting, seeing what they call uh, Muslims now call them terrorists. But they've been doing it for a long time. What's that guy's name? Edward Said in his book 
covering Islam, which was written in about 1981, 1981. He said that, you know, this, that what they're doing towards Islam is looking like they're doing some sort of cold war. And he said that in 1981, before, you know, all this sort of stuff came out after 9-11 and things like that. We need to know all these miracles because it just strengthens them on and it makes, you know, it just gives you a bit of a boost really. And, you know, we do, we do need these sort of uh, uh, Iman injections maybe. <laughs> Okay, so number 12, sorry about that. Wa minha an Isa alayhi salam abra'a al-akma'ahu ma'a baqa'a aynahu fil maqra'aha Rasulullah radda aynahu an sa'alta an khada'a wa fihi mu'jiza fi wajyahayn Ihduhuma li ta'amaha ba'da saylanaha وآخر رد بس إليه بعد فقدها منها. So number twelve. This is on page twenty-seven. Another favor of him is that Isa عليه السلام healed a blind person whose eye remained in its normal place, while the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم restored an eye after it was hanging down on the person's cheek. So on the day of Uhud. So if you look to footnote uh, nineteen. So on the day of Uhud, one of the Sahaba was fighting. Uh, basically, his eye was wounded, and he was dang, uh, hanging, dangling down his cheek, basically. And he came to the prophet. Now, what the prophet did was he put some of his blessed saliva on it. Then he put it back into that sahabi's eye. So he put the eye back into the socket, right? And so then the sahabi could see better out of that eye than he could before. Yeah, ask him. Uh, okay, so what happened was that um, Ali had uh, basically uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "I'm going to give the banner because they were about to go into Khandak, which was there was a Jewish tribe who was opposing the Prophet and they were causing problems and they were they were doing lots of bad things in Medina, and so basically they had broken a treaty as well. So they broken a treaty with the Muslims to not side with the pagan creation. They sided with the pagan creation and helped them." So they'd broken a treaty, a peace treaty. So then the Prophet went to fight uh, to to uh, to stop them because they were real danger um, for the Muslims. And so basically, the Prophet said, "I'm going to give tomorrow. I'm going to give the flag to someone who loves Allah and His Messenger." So Ali wasn't there at the time because he had some. Uh, I think he, what's it called? Um, is it, you know, when the eye gets red, what's that called? Yeah, that's it. So he had that problem in his eye. Conjunctivitis. Yeah, so he had a problem in his eye, and so then he, the Prophet, looked around and didn't see Ali. And Umar said that he was on his tiptoes because he thought that you know, because the Prophet was looking around, so Umar was on his tiptoes. And Umar himself on his tiptoes—that would have been quite a sight because Umar on the horse, his feet would reach the, <laughs> the ground. So if he was on his tiptoes, that was goodness me. So then, and then the Prophet said, where's Ali? And so they brought Ali, and then they said, oh yeah, he's got a little problem. And then so the Prophet put his blessed saliva into the eye of, of Ali. And then his eye went better than, than it was before. So you could see better out of that eye than he was before. So if it was me, and it's interesting actually, that if the uh, saliva actually has got some uh, healing qualities in it, actually, it's got some uh, antiseptic qualities in it, I think. I don't know if anyone else knows. Yeah, I think he's got some antiseptic qualities in saliva, in normal saliva. But the Prophet's saliva would have been, obviously, much more greater than anyone else's saliva anyway. So. Right, number 14. Oh no, I'm going to be on number 13. Yeah, number 13. وَمِنْ هَا أَنَّ أَمْوَاتَ الَّذِينَ أَحْيَاهُمْ مِنَ الْقُفَى بِالْإِمَانِ وَأَكْثَرَ عَدَذَ مِنْ مَا أَحْيَاهُمْ بِأَحْيَاتَ الْأَبْدَانِ وَشِتَّانَ بَيْنَ أَحْيَاتُ وَالْأَبْدَانِ uh, Iman al-Abdan. So one favor is that the spiritually dead who are brought from disbelief to the life of Iman are greater than those whom Isa alayhi salam revived from physical death. So what a difference between there is between the life of Iman and physical life. So this is when obviously Isa alayhi salam would bring the dead back to life. There is actually a miracle of the Prophet where one of the Sahaba had buried one of the daughters because what this is one of the things they used to do is they used to they, they, because it was a whole sort of tribe type thing 
and in a tribe it's the males that are seen as the you know the the great thing to have lots of ma males in your family whatever right and what they used to do unfortunately in those times is if they had a girl they would bury them alive so um, one of the Sahaba came to the Prophet and he was very sad that he'd done this and then the Prophet went to the grave of the baby girl and the baby girl basically talked to the Prophet and then she said that she, she said that I'd tell the, fa the father forgiving him and then what I've got now is greater than what I could have had so the Prophet did t speak to you know if you're trying to compare miracles like you know that Isa raised up someone from uh, brought someone back to life but the Prophet did speak to someone and, and, and he gave the child a choice he says you can come back to life or you can just um, stay there and the child chose to stay in the uh, grave and there is another miracle as well um, which the Prophet uh, there was a lady basically she, she had her only son and that's all she had and she came to the Prophet and said oh yeah I've, I've had uh, my son's died what a catastrophe and she complained to the Prophet and she said can I pray just that I can just see him again and so then basically he died and then he came back to life and then they actually had a uh, they actually ate, he actually ate with them so they actually ate some food with them so that's just another mi uh, miracle of that of that nature so and also bringing someone back from the you know back from disbelief to faith is probably a great miracle miracle in itself so if you look at the Sahaba like if you look at the life of Omar that he was you know he was upcoming Sahaba upcoming in Quraysh and then when he became Muslim he became one of the you know the great um, obviously second to Abu Bakr but one of the great um, Sahaba and he I mean that's some of the things he did in terms of like um, administration were quite amazing like he, he was the first one to actually put like child support, they actually gave you know the families of kids a certain amount of money from the public funds, and he also gave out certain money amount uh, to old people as well. So they had uh, you know because he found he was in Damascus and he found uh, one of the old Jewish men uh, begging, and so he said you know you know what's wrong? How can you begging? And he says well you know I've got to pay the jizya or whatever, and then he admonished the leader. And I said, right, okay. Then now what we've, got, what, we've got, what we've got to have is like some sort of money that's going to go to them, to these old people, because you know they're old now, they can't work. So we're going to give them some money, and the, the state, the, the 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 public funds are going to look after them. So this is the first time, probably in history, that uh, the old were looked after. So uh, that's a miracle in itself, really. That you see, uh, you know, such a change, change in such a man. And a lot of the Sahaba, they they all like that. They, they they completely just change completely. And the amount of Sahaba that was with the Prophet, and the amount of community that he changed, it's actually quite amazing, really. And if you look, if you just look at the Sahaba, that's enough proof to know that the proof uh, of the Prophet, really. If you look at the Sahaba, and that's really uh, what that line was all about, really. That well, that number, number thirteen, that's what it's all about. And number fourteen. ومنها أن الله عز وجل كتب لكل نبي من الآخرين بقدر عمله أمته وأحوالها وأقوالها ومتى شتر إحلى الجنة وقد أخبر الله تعالى أنهم خير الأمة أخرجت للناس وإنما كانوا خير الأمة لما اتصفوا به من المعرفة والأحوال وأقوال والعمل وأعمال فما من معرفتي ولا حال ولا عبرة ولا عبادة سوري ولا مقالة ولا شيء مما يتقرب به إلى الله تعالى مما دل عليه رسول الله دعوة إليه إلا وله أجره وأجر من عمل به إلى يوم القيامة لقوله من دعا إلى خدا فكان له أجره وأجر من عمل به إلى يوم القيامة ولا يبلغ أحد من الأنبياء هذا مرتبة وقد جاء حديث أن خلق عيال الله وأحبهم إليه أنفعهم لعياله So on page 28, number 14 So another favor is that Allah the Exalted records a reward for every prophet according to their 
contrary action states in the words of his community and his community will be half of the people of the paradise of the garden and Allah exalt, uh, exalted is he reported that his community i.e. the Muslims is the best community bar to people their being the best of all communities is because of the knowledge good, goodly states, words and actions which characterize them every knowledge, good state, worship, statement or anything by which one draws close to Allah mighty and exalted is he that the message of Allah directed people to and prayed for has the reward of it and the reward of whoever acts by it until the day of rising because of his words whoever calls to guidance has the reward for it and the reward of whoever acts by it until the day of rising none of the other prophets reach this rank so basically what it's saying there in that section this is quite a large section actually that whoever the, the community of the prophet does something it goes back, the benefit of it or the reward of it goes back to the prophet so none of the other prophets had this because basically the Muslim Ummah is, you know, the, the, the blessings that the Muslim Ummah has received and the world has received from Islam is extremely great and I was thinking about this the other day that the, there's a statement of the prophet saying idrahu al hudud bi shubhat so do not give out the penal punishment i.e. Stone, for stoning or whatever, anything because of doubt. So if there's a doubt into the in, doubt in the ruling of, a, of, the, of the penal punishment of someone who's being killed, if someone's killed someone else, and for them to be killed, or stoning or whatever, if there's a doubt in the case, then you don't perform the 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 case. Actually, doesn't, we don't do the case. So for example, someone co someone comes and is, uh, they say that so and so has committed some act, and basically we don't have sufficient. We've got some doubt basically uh, then the act is not carried out and this is actually taken into English law because a lot of this because I was saying like some I've said to you some of your brothers before um, how the British law is actually a recipient of actual being copied from European law which is itself, itself copied from Spanish law and law from Italy which, excel, which itself was copied from the Muslims in like 11th century and it's actually ended up into the UK by Henry the lawgiver as that's what they call him because he reported all this law into uh, into the uh, into British um, society and everything and so he enforced all this law but all that law was basically from the Muslims and so the part of the English law is that you, that you have to have beyond reasonable doubt isn't it? you've got to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. So how can you have that principle beyond reasonable doubt without this hadith? You can't, can you? So it's got to come from somewhere so it's got to, it's, it's got to come from the Prophet and so there, there's no previous precedence for them within the history of humani humanity, humanity but there's a hadith here. So all that other stuff comes here but there's a hadith here so where, where have they got this from? They've got it, they've got it from us really and how many, uh, uh, you know, how many people have copied off British law, which itself is just, uh, it's just another madhab of the Muslim law. <laughs> we'll call it Henry, because it's from Henry. Thomas Beckett, he was killed because he didn't want this law that Henry II, the lawgiver, was putting through. And he said, I don't want this law, and he, and he basically was against it. And the reason why he was against it, and he was actually killed, and, he's, and in the Christian things they call him a saint, right? But we don't consider him a saint. But the reason why he was protesting was because it's part of Islam. Because it's part of Islam law. And it would be the same, similar things happened in like India and that place when they were adopting English law. Because they were opposing it as well. That's all very interesting. So this is one of the ways that the Prophet has benefited all people. You know, and then like the number system. The number system is the Muslim uh, development. So the number system on like a clock, we've got a clock in here somewhere. Or any any number system. All the number system is actually a Muslim invention. The actual numbers that you see on like like Quran and that lot, that's actually Indian numbers. But the actual normal number systems that we have, like these, you get the barcodes, whatever. All these are actually numbers it's the Muslims that are actually working <coughs> the numbers out. 
So if you take that number system out of the world, right, you can't do anything. You can't run computers, you can't just sit at home, you can't even drive a car, whatever. So this has all come from Islam, so... Yeah, so Ibn Sina, uh, his book he wrote, uh, Al-Qanun Fitib, which was the canon in medicine, he wrote in the 10th century. They were still using that in, in France un until 100 years ago. 100 odd years ago, in, Fran in, Fr in France, until they started to do their own things and then copied from whatever else. And, and it was actually, this is a very interesting thing, that in, uh, they, they used to have the Latin on one side and the Arabic on the other side. And in medical books, all right, and this is still this is only like 200 years ago that it's, that it's sort of phased out. So they used to have Arabic on one side, sorry, Latin on one side, and Arabic on one other side. So why would they put the Arabic there if they couldn't read it? There was no point putting the Arabic there if they couldn't read it, all right? So they put it there. So what could they, what was the, what was the purpose of putting the Arabic there? So they could compare it to the the translation. So they were doing this uh, all the time, and even, uh, what's that guy's name from Apple, Newton, uh, copied off all the Muslims, and then he said, oh yeah, Apple dropped in my head, or whatever. He just copied it out of one of some of the Muslim books, and whatever, and just made it up his own, and then, you know, could drop something else on him as well. But, um, and he had books, he had the, uh, he, all his books mostly were Arabic, and this is like in his time, because it was just the language of science until about... 16th century maybe, 16th century when they started to do their own sort of books. So this is all about the things that Allah has given to this Ummah that has benefited the whole humanity. You know, like uh, like even washing, like uh, like after they, they uh, when they were trying to make sure that there was no Muslims in Spain and they're trying to kick out all the Muslims after the Caliph fell in uh, 1492. They were looking for Muslims to hunt them down and kill them or whatever, or force them into Christianity. And one of the ways they used to find out if they were Muslim or not is if they used to wash. Because washing was a heathen act, wasn't it? So, and they used to, what, he washes Muslim, right? And so one of the things that they create, I can't believe, you think about this, it's bonkers, right? One of the things, right, was well, that the Christian rulers, when the first thing he came in to a Muslim city after he conquered it, right, and he he subdued all the Muslims, right? It was to close down the baths, the public baths. So people couldn't wash. That's the first thing he did. First, okay, I'm like, what? what? And so he goes, oh, well, oh, you Muslims are washing, we know who you are. Yeah, so basically, even just how to wash, the whole world owes it to the Prophet. There was a funny story I like to tell about Darwin, that he, he was ill all the time, and then he went to a guy, this is like 18th century, and he went to a guy and then the guy just said, okay, I'm just going to wash you in different types of water and then he was better. That's because you want washing, that's why. Why do you think you'll get any of you want washing? I told him not to give me some coffee. Eh? Hey? Okay, so there's a report in Hadith that created beings are the descendants of Allah and the most beloved of them are the ones who are most best beneficial to his dependents. The best of those beings are the ones more, most beneficial to the beings. That's what that hadith means. So the created beings are dependents of Allah, and the most beloved of them are those who are most beneficial to their dependents, to his dependents. So since the, uh, since the Prophet, so basically this also says, the most beneficial person to humanity is who? It's the Prophet, isn't it? Now, how many people have benefited from the fact that they're washed now? You know, the knowledge is, you know, the first uh, university was made where? First, in 18 something, 18, uh, no, 850 eight something, by a Muslim woman called Fatima Fahriya. First university in the world was made by a Muslim woman. That puts all Muslims and Muslim men to shame, doesn't it? So it was made in 8 something in Fez, in, in Morocco. And that was the first university. And the universities didn't actually start to prop up in the West until 11th and 12th century. And that was after the Crusades. Because after the Crusades, the, the Christians actually benefited quite a lot from coming into contact with the Muslims. Sorry? I think it was 853, I think. It was 8 something. If you check Fatima, Fahriya, and Fez, and you'll find her uh, details. It's still going now. Um, I think this was probably. There's different reports on this, and it was basically, I think it was more, more or less, 
or the whole uh, it was like previous communities 999 will be taken from one from you I think it was about previous community if I remember rightly because um, I remember someone speaking about it um, it was about previous communities it was about previous communities like 999 of them w one of them will go to paradise and only 90 and the rest of them 99 like out of 100 people 99 will go to uh, uh, hell and then one of them would uh, go to paradise and this was out of the previous communities I think if it's a right uh, if I remember rightly and then changed slightly with the Muslim community so uh, it was more or less about previous communities like the 99 of them out of a hundred would go to the hellfire because there wasn't many believers in that time and so even now we've still got a lot of disbelievers so and there's always will be probably uh, up until a certain point there will be more disbelievers than believers that's really what I'm lying is on, uh, it's referring to so 99 that, sorry 99 Oh no, hang on. 999 will be uh, out there. Uh, Umar will, you know, previous Umars will go to the hell, uh, and then only one will survive out of those, you know, one out of a thousand basically will survive. But that was mostly our previous communities because there wasn't many people who were believing in that time. And then the Prophet goes on that says half the people of the garden will be from the, and it goes for the third, and it keeps going on for, so for, for our community. So our community as a Muslim Ummah compared to the rest of the community is like, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's a, I don't know what percentage that is, but 99, what was that, one out of a thousand, what is it, one out of a thousand, isn't it? Yeah, so one out of a thousand, so our community compared to the other communities is like one out of a, uh, a thousand. But that one out of a thousand will be potentially half of the paradise, or a third, so it's not a lot compared to the rest of the, the previous. Where m m we've got the most even though we've come last we've got the most out of the rest of the other you know communities so the rest of the other whatever communities there were that only they only make half and we're the last one and we make half okay so since the prophet was beneficial to half of the people of the garden on the other half and the other prophets were only beneficial to one section of the other half of his position so also his nearness to Allah according to his position of being benefit, there's no lost it. I say it's a G as well uh, of his community, but that the like of the reward of his gnosis is added to the gnosis of the prophet. So that is basically every wali has a link to the prophet, and his link is part of the benefit that the prophet gets as well of the the wali gets as well. There's none of his community with a goodly state, but that the prophet. So the uh, so has the same reward for his state, added to the states of the Prophet. So in page 30 now, there is no, there's no one with a statement by which he draws near to Allah the Mighty, but the Prophet has the same reward of that statement, added to his statements, and he's conveying over his message. So there is no action by which one draws near to Allah Mighty and Exalted is he, whether of prayer, zakat, freeing slaves, uh, jihad, piety, vicar, steadfast, pardoning and forgiving but the, the Prophet has the same reward as the one who does it added to his reward for his action but it doesn't, it doesn't diminish the, the reward of the person doing the action so the person doing the action even though the Prophet is getting some uh, getting reward for it it doesn't diminish his uh, reward so there's no high degree or glorious rank uh, which any of his community obtains by his guidance and direction but the Prophet so that's a so has the same reward added to his degree and rank that is multiplied because of those of his community who call people to guidance or initiate a good sunnah so all these people are calling to guidance are going to, uh, calling to the guidance of following the Prophet is also increasing the Prophet's reward there is no high degree or glorious rank which any of his community obtains by God. ok I've read that one that is multiplied because of those that is multiplied because this is why Musa wept on the night of uh, on the night a journey. So on the Isra, Musa wept with his longing for the good fortune of the Prophet, since more of his community would enter the garden than those of the community of Musa, alayhi salam. So he did not weep out of envious resentment, as some ignorant people imagine. Rather, it was for sorrow for what he had missed of a rank like this. So on the night of Miraj. 
Musa a.s. was crying because of the benefits of the, the Ummah the Prophet would get that his Ummah wouldn't get and the Hadith yeah so it's in footnote 27 if you look at the last line of footnote 27 on page 30 it says when I passed he wept and asked what makes you weep and he replied I weep because a yeah I don't think that's probably appropriate translation actually because someone was sent after me and will have more of his community enter the garden than will enter from my community and each prophet when they saw the blessings of the of uh, the community of the prophet Muhammad so wish wish to be part of them so another favor is that Allah mighty exalted he sent every prophet to his own people while he sent our prophet Muhammad so to jinn and mankind and so there's a ayah in Surah Araf where he said, where Allah says to the Prophet, قُلْ يَا أَيْهُ النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Which is, uh, the Prophet, Allah commands the Prophet to say, I am a messenger of Allah to you all. And in different commentaries of this hadith, uh, sorry, this uh, ayah, you can find lots of uh, uh, nice information about this hadith. So the Prophet was basically sent to everyone and he was the only global Prophet there wasn't a previous global Prophet ever all the previous Prophets were sent to specific communities and specific times and specific places the Prophet was sent to all people and all places and all times until the end of uh, until the day of judgment so this is another reason why the Prophet was given virtue was given some things that other prophets weren't given but we do have to be a bit careful when we talk about prophets that we don't belittle another prophet for the sake of trying to praise the prophet and this happens a lot sometimes we have to be careful with the you know the way, the way that one's worded because in disrespect of any prophet does make one leave the fold of Islam so that's a dangerous dangerous game to play but we say that Allah has blessed the prophet in ways that he hasn't blessed the rest of the prophets right. so you have to be very careful but yeah inshallah so we'll catch up next week inshallah and uh, finish it off